So, the power of the small. If we're talking about changing patterns, not only at the personal level, but at the social level, the global level, and that surely is what any benevolent view of ourselves or of the world would, would be interested in, in, making things better, more free, more happy, more just, more generous, more peaceful. And if it's about getting to the root of those recurrent patterns that hold us in this negative feedback of constant of the cycle of violence, for example, then it's very important that we spend a certain amount of our life reflecting on the power of the small. Because it isn't the big uses of force that change the patterns. We think it is, because we're still rather primitive, at least in the way we react to events and uh, in our own lives or even at the international level. And we feel that uh, we will solve this problem once and for all by the use of force. And we may have even good, in, good motivation in wanting to do that, it's just that it's quite clearly uh, a rather ineffective way of changing the patterns. When we notice the power of the small at work in a, in a situation or in our own lives, and we see that transformation really happens by the application of that power of the small, then we can be aware of that and admire that. The problem is, is that very quickly, because we see how great is the power of the small to change events that force or violence cannot change, then we attribute to the power of the small a, f a kind of force that it doesn't have. We think that it actually is something really powerful and forceful and potentially violent. And uh, so we can see, you know, a huge discrepancy between the Jesus of the Gospels and the Christ Pantocrata of the Middle Ages, Christ coming uh, in might and fearful glory and majesty to, to judge that great Michelangelo image of Jesus with his arm outstretched waiting, waiting to sweep away his enemies and so on. And suddenly we notice that this power of the small has been magnified into something so big and so powerful in the forceful sense of the word powerful that actually it bears very little relationship to the original. And that pattern, of course, is a pattern within the life of the church, within the life of Christianity, and no doubt in the life, in the life cycles of other religions as well. Trying to get back to the spirit, the vision, the experience of the founder is one of the essential aspects of all religious renewal. Contemplative life in the church, just to focus on the church, because otherwise we, we get into too big a scenario, but in the life of the church, the, this pattern of, um, of renewal through the small and through the contemplative has been, is, is a very well-established pattern. Reform, renewal, recovering a, a connection to our roots happens through the power of the small. Uh, just take St. Therese of Lisieux, for example, or St. Francis of Assisi, or the present Pope, 
who works with a great deal of restraint. He, he's one of the most powerful CEO, probably the most powerful CEO, for what it's worth, in the world. But he's exercising his power in a very restrained way and exercising it in a way that looks as if it's actually being delegated and shared in the same way that Jesus shared his power with his disciples. He didn't aggregate all power to himself, say, I'm the only one who can do miracles. You know, it's my job to do the miracles. And uh, you, just, you, you, you just handle the collections. Uh, he, and there is an interpretation of, of the, you know, rather speculative uh, idea that actually Jesus, you know, when the, when in, in the Gospel of, uh, in my mind for a moment, I think it's the Gospel of Mark, where the, the mother and brothers of Jesus in the Gospel translation come to Jesus watching him speak to a large audience and thinking that he has gone out of his mind uh, and they want to, to come and take him home. And one of the interpretations is, is that he was a, a, a successful healer and uh, it would be very good for Nazareth to have um, its own healer. It would attract people in the same way that relics attracted uh, pilgrims <laughs> in the past. So, uh, but Jesus didn't, didn't operate in that monopolistic way. He didn't monopolize power, he gave power. He exuded it, and he shared it, and he transmitted it. It's the whole meaning of Pentecost, and the transmission of his power, his dynamos, the Greek word dynamos is dynamic energy, he communicated, transmitted this to his disciples, and we see it happening even in his own lifetime, where he, would send, he sent them out in, in two by two and uh, told them what to do, and they came back amazed at what they could do, but they didn't realize that they had this capacity, these gifts. They still didn't know quite how to use them, and uh, he, he, there was still quite a bit of training that they had to go through, the, the big training they didn't want to go through, of course, was that he would abandon them and leave them on their own. But that's what he said he had to do. It is good for you that I am going away, paraphrasing, uh, because otherwise you would always be dependent on me. But actually what I'm here to, to show you is that this power of the Spirit, and I'm still going to be with you in, in the Spirit, is the Holy Spirit which I will send to you. But you've got to stand on your own feet and do this yourself. And you don't just stand in the light of this great celebrity who is the, the one there, you know, <clears throat> hitting the headlines. Uh, in this period, uh, you don't just stand in my limelight, Jesus says, and you don't get your power from that limelight, the power is within you. And I can, through relationship with me, I can put you in touch with that power. I can transform your minds, because you will realize what you have within you, and that you don't want to be hanging around just uh, in this codependent state. Well, he refuses to be codependent anyway, so it would just be dependent. So, there is a way of understanding how the power of the small operates. Because the power of the great, which leads inevitably at some point to violence or the oppressive use of force, and sometimes there can be a, a subtle shift from one to the other. Nobody, well, many people, probably the people who were working for the Inquisition didn't, when they, when they, when they joined uh, the seminary or the religious orders, 
Um, the only religious order that did not take part in the Inquisition was what? The Benedictines. Uh, but when they joined up, you know, they probably didn't say, oh, good, I hope I can get uh, promoted to the Inquisition. <laughs> I can torture people and uh, submit them to third degree. Uh, but at some point or other, some of them, of course, ended up, uh, no doubt because of flaws in their own personality and the approval of higher authorities, that's how all oppressive regimes work, they found themselves um, in this uh, uh, exercising force through violence. So, Jesus quite clearly doesn't apply um, that kind of force of persuasion. So what does he do? He surrenders or he gives away his power. That's the power of the small. Not that you hold on to it and, and, and accumulate it and defend it, but you actually just give it away. Even if you don't know, of course, for sure, as he didn't, how it was going to be received. He was disappointed that they took them so long to receive it properly, and some of them clearly didn't receive it. Many of them left him because he was, what he was saying was too much for them to take. So we have a very clear example in the Gospels, one of the most memorable, I think, one could ever imagine. Um, maybe something similar, not at the same level, of course, but say in The Tempest, where Prospero the magician who has accumulated magical arts and great power over nature, um, sort of a symbol of Shakespeare himself is often thought. Um, finally, um, uh, is able to confront those who had uh, destroyed him and exiled him and tried to kill him. And it ends... Uh, on this amazing Christian, not explicitly, but clearly amazingly Christian note of forgiveness. And Prospero um, forgives. He hands over to the next generation. He presides over the union of his daughter with the son of the man who tried to kill him. And... Uh, there is this, and, and then he breaks his, his magical staff and throws away his magical books, and he's renouncing power. Wonderful image of old age. Helen, Helen Luke has written some beautiful uh, commentaries on, uh, <coughs> on that and on Dante, uh, explaining or describing the, the way we should learn to age. So, Prospero here, in, 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 in a fictional way, uh, symbolizes the power of the small uh, in the transmission and the surrendering of power. Now, <clears throat> uh, Prospero was brought to that wisdom through the love that he had for his daughter, and through, uh, well, through, through many aspects of the play. Now, Jesus, uh, not a fictional character, but described in, in the uh, literary texts of the scriptures, um, struggled with the uh, use of power as force early at the beginning, actually, the preceding his public career in the, his time in the desert. It was here when the devil came to tempt him during his 40 days in the desert that he was tempted from within, as we are all tempted by the ego, to accumulate power and, man, and manipulate it and use it 
maybe for good reasons. All the reasons that the devil was giving Jesus were, you know, could be construed as good for others, you know. And he simply refused that way of using power. He recognized it. It wasn't that he didn't have an ego. It's that he understood his ego. He understood it intuitively and immediately. And if he was without sin, it was because he could, he, even under the powerful influence of the ego, he was able to see the difference between illusion and reality, between the fantasy of power up there on the parapet of the temple, wherever, and mountain looking down on the world, and being able to change stones into bread, realizing at the peak of his power that he could do all this, he realized that to go in that direction would be illusion. That would have been sin. And it's, sin is whenever we fail to see the difference between illusion and reality, and illusion is often more seductive, immediately seductive, and of course offers <coughs> um, the, uh, the pleasure of instant gratification. Whereas reality draws us into a higher or broader and deeper level of consciousness, which brings a, a joy and a satisfaction and an experience of fullness much greater than instant, the instant gratification of the ego, but it, uh, it, uh, it, it, is, it is demanding. It, it demands clarity, a certain kind of spiritual intelligence, and, of course, faith. When uh, there was a psychological experiment, the children were given some marshmallows, uh, and they were each given six marshmallows, and then the, the uh, researcher uh, said to them, now, I'm going to go out of the room for 10 minutes. And um, those of you who do not eat any of the marshmallows while I'm out of the room, you will be given more. And uh, he left the room, and something like 80% of the children ate couldn't resist it, and they had the marshmallows. Either they didn't believe him, or they blocked it out, or for whatever reason, they uh, gave way to instant gratification. And actually, interestingly enough, the 20% who waited were those who, in other tests, showed leadership skills. In any case, what we see in, in, the, in the Gospel, in Jesus of the Gospel, is a human being of extraordinary normality. And the normality, which is quite a rare thing, how many normal people do you know? Uh, his normality was simply that he was able to perceive the distinction between illusion and reality. He could see where the ego was at work. And he exercised his judgment and his decision-making uh, on the basis of that distinction. He went for reality. So, the power of the small is that it renounces power, but it brings about extraordinary transformation. In the I Ching, which is one of the great uh, wisdom texts of the world, written before Confucius. Confucius wrote commentaries on the I Ching. And the I Ching is composed of uh, 64 hexagrams um, built on the relationship between yin and yang. Uh, and it's a way of perceiving in any situation of life that you may be in, where you are in the cycle. Life is seen as a cyclical process Things reach their plenitude, the harvest, and then uh, the cycle uh, continues and there's a, there's a weakening, the yin, and then when it hits the bottom, 
uh, of the cycle that begins to grow and expand again. And over the years, I think I, I've been able to see a little bit of that at work in our community, in different national communities. I mean, I think you can see it in all sorts of ways as well. But I think you can see it in, in community living, community life, um, where uh, communities uh, grow, they reach a certain peak, and then they, there can be a sort of decline. And handling the, the, the decline without despair, without anger, is, uh, is wisdom. And if you can handle it and recognize what is happening and stay with it and don't give up, then you'll find that it will rise again. There is a cycle to all life. I mean, after all, we do this every day. We get up in the morning feeling bright and bushy-tailed, and by the evening we're all exhausted. And so you go to bed and start again. So that cycle of, of life is one of the cycles within life, within the linear process of life. So anyway, this is, this is more or less what the I Ching uh, helps you to, uh, to be aware of with extraordinary wisdom and through great uh, symbols. It's, it's really through symbols that the greatest truths are communicated. This is why it, 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 or it, it um, always feels so sad when you hear religious people arguing with such violent passion about uh, formulas of words, uh, as if the truth were in, incarnate in those particular formulas or expressions or beliefs. And there will be, and people have been, and will be probably, prepared to, to, to do violence to each other over their attachment to these particular expressions or beliefs. Not recognizing that, of course, they have a value, these creedal statements, but they are symbolic. They can only be symbolic if they are truly expressing ultimate reality, if they're truly speaking about God, then they can only be symbolic. You can never capture God as, you know, I mean, even with a camera, you, you, you capture an instant of reality on your digital camera. And it may or may not be pleasing to look at, but that's all it is. It's an instant uh, frozen in, in time. It's not the full reality. It may, it becomes a symbol. And uh, if it's a lucky shot, then it can become a very potent and inspirational symbol of the reality that, that you were watching or feeling yourself part of when you took the picture and that made you want to take the picture. But it's in itself, you don't worship the picture. I mean, some pictures are better than others and might be worth keeping. But um, most of them you should delete. <laughs> but uh, in the same way, our images of God, our ideas about God, our definitions of God, our theologies, they have a, a great potential, a great uh, um, capacity to to raise our understanding, to inspire us, to engage us with reality. But the minute we begin to worship them as ultimate expressions of the ultimate, then we have become trapped by our own creations. We're worshiping an idol. We're worshiping an image. That's why St. Gregory of Nyssa says, every image of God is an idol. And religious people, this is the great danger of religious people, it's idolatry. If the great danger of a sports, of an athlete, is cheating, then, or the great danger of a financial investor is, uh, I don't know, fraud, then the great danger of religious people is idolatry. These are all easy options 
into which we are seductively led by the ego's promise of instant gratification. And for religious people, it's the instant gratification of believing that you are in possession of the truth. Instead of understanding that it is the truth that possesses you. So, in the I Ching, uh, this great wisdom text, which is fil filled with uh, Chinese uh, symbols, such as, I forget now, one, one of them, for example, is of warning you in a particular situation, uh, you have to be like the fox walking on thin ice. You know, so symbols like that, using symbols like that. And the 62nd uh, hexagram of the I Ching is translated as great smallness. Great smallness. And the image at the heart of that hexagram is a soaring bird, a bird flying high in the sky. But the meaning of it is that, of course, the bird should not fly too high. And the bird should not think that it can fly into the sun because it must return to its nest. That's where it belongs, where it must return. And the meaning here is don't lose the experience of being grounded, of having, of, of, of having the ground under your feet. Work on small things, not great things. The I Ching says in this hexagram. Modesty and conscious, conscientiousness are sure to succeed. That doesn't mean that you have to be servile or make yourself into a doormat. Quite the reverse, it means you have to find the place of dignity within yourself where you respect yourself and know yourself. And out of that place of dignity and self-knowledge and self-respect will come correct behavior. You will do the right thing in the right way. And think of how the mighty are taken from their thrones. Think of how the media will destroy the mighty, which it has, once it has put them on a pedestal, which they have allowed themselves to be put, uh, then they, it is often their downfall is often simply that they have lost touch with the ground of their being with, and their modesty, their conscientiousness, their sense of personal self-respect has been lost in the wake of their success. And they find themselves successful and powerful. They have gained the world, but they have lost their true self. And I think at any moment in history, you could meet many people in those kind of positions of power who are already feeling that, a, felt, a feeling that they have lost something essential to their own humanity. And finally, the I Ching says that if we understand the great smallness of life, we will always be on the side of the lowly. We live in a celebrity culture. Now, Celebrity is the worship of power, or influence, greatness. And uh, in such a culture, in such a society, it is more often than not the case that the lowly, the vulnerable, will suffer most, will be downgraded and degraded in the most inhumane way. And often, I mean, this 
can find expression in economic policy and politics. The Victorians had this, uh, justified this when they set up the workhouses to deal with the poor. Uh, and they're, they basically were operating on the principle that the poor were poor because of their own fault. Because they didn't go out and get a job and become great and powerful. Well, not everybody has those gifts. Not everybody has that drive or that intelligence. Just because you had it doesn't mean that um, you're going to succeed, but you probably won't succeed much without it. But there are those many who don't have that drive. They have other gifts, but they're, never, they're always going to be lowly by comparison with that standard. And it is these people, of course, in a culture that is worshipping power and uh, celebrity or greatness, and that's temptation of all societies, of course, but uh, it, it, these, these, are, these, are those, these are the people who are going to be forgotten, voiceless, and um, rejected. Who, who does Jesus identify with? Well, very clearly, with the poor. And that's the power of smallness. By the renunciation of power over others, we find ourselves in empathy with others, in harmony with others, and with all others. We're all poor in different ways. <coughs> Human existence is really an experience of poverty, if we <coughs> think about it. However, I was reading a story on Rupert Murdoch uh, the other day, at the age of, what is he, 85? He has this insatiable, uh, well, let's say, desire for more power, more acquisition, more, mer more takeovers. And uh, in this, I was thinking it was in The Economist, and they were saying if he succeeds, I don't know, taking over Time Warner, whatever it was, then uh, you know, this is going to spark off a whole new chain of takeover bids, takeover frenzy. So here's an 83-year-old man who is, uh, well, has a lot of energy, I suppose, and uh, is uh, focusing uh, all of that energy, as far as we can see. I can't make any personal judgment, but I can only, can only use him as a symbol, as the media present him, so nothing personal. But uh, clearly, at the age of 83, well, you would think you might be thinking of other things rather than just your next takeover bid. What makes us essentially poor as human beings is, of course, our mortality. and our awareness of mortality. The fact that we are conscious of being mortal, of creatures destined to die, and no one gets very far in life without experiencing death, then it's that, it's that above all, that should keep us grounded. And so St. Benedict says, and all the great religious traditions have a similar kind of practice. St. Benedict says, keep death always before your eyes. Now that might sound a bit morbid to a culture like ours, which is rather a death-denying culture, and a medicalized, with a medicalized view of health, whose ultimate goal would be just, just to keep on replacing our body parts and so until we became virtually immortal and sees death itself as a medical failure, not as a mystery in the transformation process of life, not as a transformative experience in itself. Clearly, anybody who has been with anybody who has died, I think, is aware that 
this is ineffable, but it is trans certainly is transformative. And uh, anybody who has had a near-death experience will say that their life has been transformed to some degree by it. So, but in the medical, medicalized view of life, uh, uh, death is a failure of techno-science to achieve this fantasy of immortality. So, keeping death constantly before your eyes is actually the opposite of being morbid. It is actually what enables us to remain sharp, focused, and capable of enjoying the gift of life as it flows uh, not in the still shots of a digital camera, uh, but uh, in the flow in the stream, streaming of life. If you visit our website, um, you may have read some of the, the blogs that Anne MacDonald from England has been writing. She's uh, suffering from quite a serious cancer, and her life has been, of course, very much transformed by that illness, but uh, she writes these, I visited her recently, uh, and she sits much of the time, she still sees people for spiritual direction and so on, but um, she has a meditation room in her garden, people come to use it. She spends much of her time in the living room, or in the sort of sunroom, I suppose, looking out onto the garden, and it's become very acquainted with the, with the birds and the wildlife and the garden. Anyway, if you read her, her, um, her blogs, because she describes life in a very lively and beautiful and way, an <coughs> en entrancing way. There's so many people um, who, for whom death is something that should be ignored, repressed, or forgotten. Uh, life has lost its enchantment. Life becomes this two-dimensional struggle for power, for survival, pleasure, entertainment. Stressed out existence. But very often, for those who are in touch with their mortality, life is re-enchanted. And there is no encounter, no moment, that doesn't have some gift to offer, some glow of the divine to radiate to us. And perhaps meditation helps us with this, because in a sense, as John Main described it in uh, his teaching, meditation is a kind of a dying. So every time we meditate, we enter into the death and resurrection of Jesus, into this cycle within the cycle of life. St. Paul says, I carry within me the death of Christ. And in meditation, by, that, by this simple but radically simple work of renouncing power, renouncing the seductive temptations of the ego, to greatness, to control, or to the use of violence, either in fact or in fantasy. By renouncing this power of the ego in meditation, to the best of our limited ability, and even, if, even though, like as St. Therese of Lisieux realized, we are imperfect in everything we do, and therefore we will be imperfect in our meditation too, well, accept it. Accept your imperfection in meditation. If you want to continue meditating, that's what actually you've got to do. Probably we give up meditation frequently only because we can't accept our imperfection. If we really understood what accepting our imperfection means, as St. Therese said, and remember her other point, she only had two points, 
from which he became a doctor of the church, uh, along with Thomas Aquinas, was uh, the other point she makes is that God is revealed through mercy and forgiveness. So, in meditation, we accept our imperfection and by the renouncing of power, by the laying aside of our thoughts, then we do experience a dying. But with the dying, of course, comes the new life. Anybody who enters into death, in any kind of death, could be the death, a physical death, could be a psychological death, could be the death of a relationship, could be the death of hopes or dreams you had. But anybody who enters into death with faith, and this is what we mean by faith, will find new life. So human existence is poor in this sense, above all because we are mortal, and because we don't often get what we want, and if we get it, it doesn't usually hang around forever. The devil, we know from the temptation of Jesus in the desert, offers us strength, security, abundance, power, control. The first of the Beatitudes is poverty of spirit. Happy or blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Let's start at the second half of that Beatitude, the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Well, a good deal of the teaching of Jesus is about what the kingdom of God is. Despite the fact that he taught a lot about it and gave us pretty well a full description of what it is through his parables and, of course, his, the example of his own life, he lived his teaching. That's what gives his teaching authority, authenticity, is that he lived it. Um, but uh, in, despite the fact that he, he gave a pretty full teaching on the meaning of the kingdom of God. Clearly, his disciples didn't understand it. And the church down the ages is always struggling to really understand it, to really listen to what he is saying about, the, about what the kingdom of God is. The disciples confused it, it seems, either with a political event or with some kind of uh, structure, some kind of institution in which there would be a hierarchy and some would be higher up the hierarchy than others and they were arguing about this once on the road when he heard them and he gently but pretty strongly rebuked them for it because for their misunderstanding. And throughout history, the church has often been institutionally and individuals institution, uh, uh, personally have been uh, seduced by the image of the kingdom of God as some kind of power structure, some kind of achievement, some kind of successful corporation. And those who had the keys to the kingdom of heaven, that, that image was probably one of the most abused images of the, of the gospel, can have seen themselves at times as guardians of this power, of this castle of the kingdom of heaven. What does Jesus tell us? He tells us that it is within us it is between us. It is a state, an experience, a form of relationship. 
He tells us that it is a process, like growth, the growth of a seed. He tells us that it is something small and natural, but also something that is, is full of grace and beauty and, uh, and energy. So we have to be constantly on the alert in our own imagination for our misinterpretation of the Kingdom of God. Because if we misinterpret the Kingdom of God, we're certainly not going to understand what poverty of spirit means. These two terms are linked in this equation. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the Kingdom of God. So the Kingdom of God then, which is characterized by mercy and forgiveness, as Therese of Lisieux understood, rather than by power and manipulation and control or punishment, that the Kingdom of God is a, an experience uh, into which we enter rather than a place we are going or a reward for being good. If we work carefully on our understanding of the Kingdom of God, then we have to understand next what does he mean by saying, it is ours? How do we, do we possess the kingdom of God? Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It's not a job, it's not a, it's not a position, it's not a status. It's not the top of the pile, the top of the heap. But, he, he says it, it, it belongs to or it, it is associated with those who are poor in spirit. Not something we have, not a goal we're going to achieve, not a reward we're going to receive, but something that is simply ours. You might even say is so intimately part of ourselves, the Kingdom of Heaven is within you, that we cannot be separated from the Kingdom of Heaven. This is our true nature. This is what we sometimes can glimpse in ourselves, what other people can sometimes glimpse in us, and sometimes what we can see in other people, even the most unlikely types of people. So poverty of spirit then, what does that mean? Well, it has something to do with that sense of mortality and the recognition that we cannot possess anything permanently, even our own lives. We are born poor, we die poor. In between we may have various fantasies of, of success, of wealth, of power, possessions of status, but that crumbles very quickly under the reality of life. One way of understanding it may be by uh, analogy with the Buddhist idea of emptiness, sunyata. This is very central to, the, to all Buddhist philosophy. And it's expressed in the idea that everything is empty. Everything that exists, physical objects, uh, your own self, your relationships, the cosmos, everything to which we could give any kind of label or name is empty. It sounds a little depressing but actually it's the least depressing truth for us to discover because the, the sign that you have actually had an insight into the meaning of emptiness, you've actually tasted it, experienced it, rather than just talking about it like this, 
but the idea that the, the, the sign that you have actually experienced it is joy. You will actually experience a great rush of joy and a liberation of spirit. And emptiness, therefore, means not something negative, in fact, it, it, it's, it's a, a way of, you know, the word poverty sounds a bit negative, and the empty, word empty sounds a bit negative, uh, so we have to uh, understand what they mean carefully. The word emptiness refers to the impermanence of all things. But nothing lasts forever. I said yesterday in the letter to the Hebrews, here we have no lasting city. And if it is true that everything is impermanent, it is equally true that nothing is independent. Even the United States. The Declaration of Independence has to be qualified. <laughs> so, we are clearly interdependent beings. From the, as human beings, we're born in this totally defenseless, the most defenseless mammal that is born as the human mammal, because our heads are so big, we have to be born early, otherwise we wouldn't get out. Uh, Apparently, it's true, evolutionary speaking. So, uh, we are interdependent from the, from the very moment of birth. Emotionally, biologically, physically, socially, culturally. How could we imagine ourselves not existing within a web of relationships, interdependence? And how often, however, do we act as if we were independent? The great illusion and delusion of the ego. How often do we push people away? The very people with, with whom we may have the, the, the deepest need for relationship. I remember going to uh, I went to, I'd been to two or three AA meetings, very moved by them because of the sense of honesty, I, truth that I felt there. And I remember one young guy came in one evening in London and he was talking about, uh, he was well dressed and he said, I, you know, I've been sober for a few, I don't know, a few months now and I got off the drink and, but he said, the craving is back with me. And he said, everything I've worked for, everything I've wanted, I've got. I've got a good job, I've got a good life, I have um, a, a woman in my life who I'm living with who is wonderful. And he said, this craving is so enormous that at this minute, I don't know if I'm going to go back home sober. And he said, and all I want to do is to go back home with a bottle of whiskey and send her away. And I don't care whether I'm sober enough to go to work in the morning. And tremendous uh, honesty and, 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 and insight, wisdom. So, um, Poverty of spirit, then, like emptiness, puts us into touch with the simple truth and reality of our existence, and it exposes ruthlessly, mercilessly almost, it exposes the seductive temptations or delusions of the ego. Poverty of spirit is a hard 
path. Because it is the path, a narrow little path, as Jesus said, but it leads to life. In poverty of spirit, we learn to accept ourselves as beings who do not belong to ourselves. Poverty of spirit isn't just a virtue we acquire. And this is something we'll look at tomorrow in the light of meditation. Why meditation leads us as a direct route into poverty of spirit. If you want to know, you know, people sometimes say or complain that, you know, when they're beginning to meditate, what should I be feeling? I'm not feeling anything, or nothing is happening in my meditation. What's it for? What's supposed to happen? And the simple answer, but it, of course you can only really understand it through the light of your own experience, is simply this, that it leads you into poverty of spirit. But if you have the least inkling of what poverty of spirit means, this is a wonderful path to commit yourself to and to integrate into your daily life. But we can possess poverty of spirit only when we forget ourselves. Only as we take the attention off ourselves. The one who loves his life will lose it.